Welcome to Corvette Today, the podcast that talks about everything Corvette, with your host Steve Garrett, MC and DJ at one of the largest Corvette weekends in the country, Corvette Fun Fest, president of the Corvette Club of Kansas City, Missouri, and radio disc jockey at the number one radio station in Kansas City for over 40 years. Here's Steve Garrett. Thanks for listening to Corvette Today, the podcast that talks about everything Corvette. I'm your host, Steve Garrett. I appreciate you tuning in. You can listen to Corvette Today on all podcast platforms like iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Anchor.fm, Pandora, Stitcher, Audible, Adori Labs, and many more. You can also listen on your smart device. Just say, hey, Google or Alexa, play the podcast called Corvette Today, and you're connected. Also, visit the Corvette Today website. It's CorvetteTodayPodcast.com. You can also sign up for Corvette Today notifications, updates, and information at CorvetteToday.ck.page. And don't forget, join the Corvette Today Facebook group. We have over 2,500 members, and I'd love to have you as a member as well. And I'm also excited to tell you about the new YouTube channel for Corvette Today. Be sure and check out your favorite Corvette Today podcast now on YouTube. First, I'd like to thank our flagship sponsors of Corvette today, E-Tech. E-Tech is the expert and leader in custom flooring. Whether it's your garage floor, basement, patio, the front steps of your home, or a professional workplace, E-Tech is four times stronger than epoxy and comes with a 15-year warranty. There are hundreds of different patterns to choose from, and installation is completed in one day. You can walk on your floor in 24 hours. Call for a free estimate at 913-745-3732 or visit etekcustomcoatings.com. 913-745-3732 or etekcustomcoatings.com. I have my garage floor done with eTech and absolutely love it. I know you'll love yours too. Another flagship sponsor of Corvette today is midenginecorvetteforum.com. If you'd like to join a new vibrant forum that focuses on the new mid-engine C8 Corvette, it's free to join this friendly community. You'll meet a lot of fellow Corvette enthusiasts like yourself at midenginecorvetteforum.com. Also, a shout-out to CanadianCorvetteForum.com, welcoming Corvette owners from around the world. My guest on Corvette today is the plant manager for Corvette's Bowling Green Assembly Plant. His 30 years plus with General Motors has taken him in leadership roles from Ohio to New York to Japan and even Germany. He became plant manager for Corvette in August of 2015. He is Mr. Kai Spandy. Kai, welcome to Corvette today. Well, thanks for inviting me, Steve. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to have you here. Kai, in segment number one, let's talk about your early years. I know that you graduated from the University of Northern Iowa with an industrial technology degree in 1991 and then just jumped right in with GM that same year. Talk about the jobs that you've done with GM leading up to where you are today at the Bowling Green assembly plant. Yeah, I'm probably a little bit of a rarity in the vehicle assembly plant genre within the company because I started my career actually working working in foundries. So I worked my way through a number of different roles in engineering, sometimes supervising on the floor and in quality, and then kind of found my way into a fellowship with the United States Department of Commerce that got me a year working for a Japanese company in Japan. And then various roles in many different locations that accumulated into a directorship role for casting processes. And then from there went into plant management for casting facilities, component facilities for engines, and then engine plant leadership, and then program management. And then my last stint before coming to Bowling Green, I was actually responsible for all the powertrain dyno and development facilities in both Rüsselsheim, Germany, and Turin, Italy, or Torino, Italy, depending on where you're from, how that's pronounced. So I've been kind of north and south and east and west geographically, and then organizationally, from foundries to components to engines to manufacturing and product engineering across the globe and now in vehicle manufacturing. That's amazing. It had to be a fun tour abroad. As a matter of fact, let's talk a little bit about that because in Germany, you were responsible for overseeing a 1.4 million upgrade over there. Talk a little bit about that because that had to be a nice precursor for when we expanded the Bowling Green plant, didn't it? 
Yeah, it was actually a huge expansion. We built a new building that housed dynamometers. So in product engineering, this is in powertrain, this is where you build prototype engines and then you get them on test, meaning that you're burning fuel, trying to find out what is going on with them. And especially in the European case, the level of sophistication is always increasing as it is around the globe. And we were charged with putting in all new dynamometer facilities to do both engines, transmissions, engine and transmissions together as a unit, powertrain operations that would include climactic, meaning you could take the dyno cell to very cold levels or very hot, and then also atmospheric. So you could simulate basically being at Pike's Peak in the dead of winter, very extreme conditions. So we built that facility, which is there and running today. And that was a huge project. It was actually almost a half of a billion dollars of investment. So yeah, my career has been based upon lots of different large scale projects in my past. And so that was the most recent one before coming to Bowling Green. That's very cool. Now, tell me the truth, Kai. Is Bowling Green like your dream job for General Motors? You know, I got to tell you a story. Um, A long time ago, this is like 25 years ago, before I went to Japan, I had a chance to study at Vanderbilt for a few months to prepare myself to go to Japan from a language standpoint. And I drove by the Bowling Green assembly plant. And I'm being 100% honest. I looked over to my right driving south on I-65 and I thought, I don't even want to stop there because I know that I'll never be working there. At that time, I was 23 years old or 24 years old. It was a dream that it was so far away. It was that apple on top of the tree that you just don't even try to go get. And now that I find myself here, I'm very, very happy. So what was unobtainable at one point, then with a lot of hard work, now is my reality. That's a great story, Kai. And see, it all came true. That's fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. Hey, would you like to finish your career with General Motors there at Bowling Green? Well, I would take it one step further in the question that you have, Steve. I honestly can say, and, and I'm not making this up, every job that I've ever had, I've found a way to enjoy myself and thrive in the teams that I have a chance to work with whether I'm making an engine or testing an engine or building different things, I've always found that it's rewarding being with a fantastic team. And I have that exact experience here in Bowling Green. What is in addition to that level of, let's just say, affirmation or rewards associated with the work that you do is obviously the product that we make. And and the product that we make for everybody that's listening to this, we all know that this is the most fantastic car on the planet. So I have to say I'm happy with all the jobs I've ever had. And I'm extremely happy with this one, too. I'm just happy. to. I pinch myself that I'm a part of making history here in Bowling Green. Absolutely right, my friend. Hey, I know that you're a Corvette guy, and I know that you love big block Mm -hmm. Corvettes. Talk about the Corvettes (laughs) that you've owned and what's currently in your garage right now. Yep. So the history with me and Corvettes, some know, some may not. But I bought a Corvette. That was the first car that I bought when I started working for GM. It wasn't a new car. So in chronological order, dating back decades, was the 78 silver anniversary. I've always had a history of working on cars, too. I put my hands on them, and I always make them better. That's what happened with the next car I bought. It was kind of a basket case, 1965 convertible. I learned a lot with that car because I did a complete frame-off restoration with that car. Wow. And I actually put a big block in it. It didn't have a big block when I got it, but it did before I was done with it. Really? Um, and then I had a 69 L71, so that was a 435, 427. Uh-huh. Another big block. That was a super cool car. And then I had a 99 And then my daughter was born in 99, so we know how that works. (laughs) So things things changed. And then there was a little bit of a gap in there from a Corvette standpoint. But then getting back to Bowling Green now, that affinity has continued. Just recently, I sold a 73 that my son and I took about a year to kind of restore and get back in some really good shape. I found somebody that was very interested in buying that, and I sold that one. Then I bought a a 1999, a great car that I found in your neck of the woods. And now that's kind of a father-son project. My son considers it more his than mine, which is great because (laughs) it's one of my goals is to continue kind of the Corvette tradition within the family. Very, very nice. Well, Kai, let's take our first break. And in segment number two, let's talk about the Bowling Green expansion on Corvette Today. 
American Hydrocarbon, your one-stop shop for custom interior, exterior, and engine bay items for your C4 through C8 Corvette. We can help you create a custom look for your Corvette with carbon fiber or 10 different color patterns and styles. We've served customers in over 28 countries all around the world. Whether it's a custom-made engine cover for your new C8 mid-engine Corvette or custom-made C4 interior upgrades, American Hydrocarbon can help you transform your Corvette into a best-in-class show car. Our products have been featured in VET and Corvette magazines, so give us a call. 813-476-5638. That's 813-476-5638. Visit our website at AmericanHydrocarbon.com or email us at pat at AmericanHydrocarbon.com. Let us help you make your Corvette the car you've always wanted it to be. American Hydrocarbon. Hey, honey, are you awake? Mm, I am now. I can't sleep. Since turning 50, I keep dreaming of a red door and a blue door, somehow knowing there are only choices for retirement. Okay. Through the red door, we outlive our money. We have to rely on our kids. We're stuck on a fixed income. It's terrifying. Yeah, that would suck. But through the blue door, our money outlives us. We retire on our terms. Our kids stay our kids, not our caretakers. We make work optional. Yes, that's much better. That's what I want to, but what do we do? We call True Wealth and Company at 913-653-8783. They specialize in helping successful people make work optional. They're our fiduciary Blue Door personal wealth managers. Hey, where are you going? It's 3 a.m. I can't sleep. I'm going to check out True Wealth and Company online at retirewithtrue.com. That Blue Door is going to be our retirement. 913-653-8783. Visit us online at retirewithtrue.com. Investment advice offered through True Wealth and Company, LLC, a registered investment advisor in the state of Kansas. And now, back to Corvette Today with your host and my husband, Steve Garrett. Hey, thanks for listening to Corvette Today, the podcast that talks about everything Corvette. I'm your host, Steve Garrett. With me today is plant manager for Corvette in Bowling Green, Kentucky, Mr. Kai Spandy. Kai, in segment number two, let's talk about the Bowling Green expansion that you guys just did. You oversaw a $439 million, 450,000 square foot expansion to the plant. Talk about all the coordination it took to get that job done. Yeah, it was fantastic. And I kind of like to tell these stories when I stepped foot into the Bowling Green plant in 2015, my predecessor said, hey, there's this little thing that's going to be happening in a couple of years with a new car, and you might want to pay attention to that. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm kind of an information overload. What can another project be? No big deal. And then I started living it a little bit more, and it's like, oh my gosh, we're going to tear everything up in this factory. And the number that you quoted, $440 million, that was only the paint shop. Then we have General Assembly, and now we have a new body shop. It, it's knocking on a billion dollars, over $900 million we've spent in preparation for the C8. It's literally been an exercise in replacing, I don't have a specific percentage target, I'm going to say 98% of all the infrastructure that we had for C7 has been taken out and either modified or replaced to support the C8 production. That's amazing. Talk about some of the biggest improvements in this expansion, like the paint shop and the body shop and things like that. Yeah, so let's just start with paint. And I would take the time to give shout out to Chuck Valentini, our paint shop manager. He was in charge of running the old shop and then orchestrating the new shop. And the thing about the new shop that we have, it is not a standard process that we have within General Motors. This is a one-off factory for painting Corvettes that exists in no other location. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, we paint the panels of the Corvette off of the car. All other cars, or metal body cars, are painted all pre-assembled. So that's one difference. The second difference is that we're painting composite parts, so we're not painting metal. That creates another challenge. And then the third one is that we want to have the absolute best possible finish on the car due to the nature of our Corvette customers. They deserve the absolute best. And the accumulation of the challenges that were faced, some of the technologies that we put in gave us the ability to have an absolute, no question, world-class finish on our Corvettes. So everything went really well with the expansion, didn't it? Yeah, it really did. We And I would say that we started production of the 2020 Stingray, the C8, 
in February of last year in 2020. A majority of the infrastructure for the paint shop actually came up at the end of 2017. So the new paint shop was painting C7s and then C8s in that order. And there was a reason for that. The reason for that is that we didn't want to have to start everything for this new car all at once. So that was the strategy. Take and get the paint shop online up and running painting at that time C7 and then introduce the C8 to it, therefore reducing the risk at the launch. Meanwhile, we're building a body shop that came online about a year later. But at that same time in 2017, we took about an eight or nine week time frame and we tore our general assembly apart. Why did we do that? What was the challenge? The challenge was this. We needed to make the C8 on the line that the C7 was being manufactured on. So we had to replace everything. So we had to put in place a long-term plan for our current car that had the ability to make the previous car. So making both of those on the line at the same time. I, I remember a day where we had 17 model year, 18 model year, 19 model year, and the prototype 2020 in the factory on one time. And that was, yeah, that was a little bit of a mind-blowing <laughs> point in time. And not that those don't always exist, but it was fun. That's got to be crazy. Kai, at the very end, now with building the C8, was there much of the C7 line left intact after you were transitioned into C8? No, nothing. Well, the paint shop stood, but it was intentionally designed for the C8. So then that would maybe be taken aside. The body shop for the C7 is completely gone. We tore it apart. We had to completely replace it. We could not co-produce the C7 and have any idea on how we could modify it for the new car. And then general assembly was completely reconfigured. So when we get to the point when people can come back in and see inside our factory, The final line where the cars are started for the first time, that very short conveyor still exists. The toe-in pit or where we do wheel alignment still exists and DVT still exists. Those are really the only three, let's just say, monuments that exist. Everything else on how we assemble the car was changed. It was literally wiped clean and replaced in those short amount of weeks. That's amazing, especially when you tear everything apart and start fresh with kind of a clean slate, rebuilding it from almost scratch has got to be a huge, huge undertaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I don't even really know what words to describe it. <laughs> um, and then the expectation is that we come back up. When we came back up in the end of 2017, we not only had a brand new process, but we slowed the line down considerably, meaning all the jobs changed from a training standpoint. And we brought the new paint shop online immediately so that we were feeding that line with panels only from the new paint shop. We did not want the two to mix old shop to new shop. The level of coordination was just absolutely fantastic. And I give credit to everybody in this factory that had a piece in that because we knocked it out of the park. That's amazing. Talk about quality control, Kai. I know that with the C8 and with the new mid-engine infrastructure, quality control, had you had to up your game with that, didn't you? Yeah. So in the last year of our C7 production, our factory achieved what we call BIQ4, which is built in quality four. And this means that we have an organization that has taken quality to the enterprise level. That means that we not only have the ability to control our operations inside our factory, but we're also outside of our factory, meaning our supply base. And we are using the resources that we have in engineering also to come to the party. And we achieved that in our efforts with C7. And that really created the springboard for us to move into this new car. The new car has its own specific challenges. And I'm happy to say that go find one and go find a customer. What you're going to find is smiles. I, I get emails multiple times a week about customers who are very happy. In fact, a little story I walked outside today. It's a beautiful sunny day in Kentucky, and there happened to be a customer with his car right up near the front of the building. I was on my way to an appointment, and I took the opportunity to talk to this guy, and he was just unbelievably happy with the car. So we've done, in my opinion, a really good job from a quality standpoint, making sure that we're delivering what our customers expect, and that's a world-class product. My friend, you have done an outstanding job with this car. Going from a front-engine platform to a mid-engine platform takes a lot of doing, and everybody that I know that has a C8 grins ear to ear. So compliments to you (laughs) and everybody at Bowling Green. Yep. 
Kai, I guess we couldn't do a show or a podcast without talking about your assistant plant manager, Nora Roper. Nora is a wonderful woman. Talk about your relationship with Nora and how you both complement each other's work. You know what's really interesting? I'm going to go back to August of 2015 when I came here. Ironically, when I was the plant manager of the Romulus engine plant in Michigan, Nora was the assistant manager there. Wow. And she was also the quality manager there for a period of time. So when I walked into the Bowling Green plant, I knew a number of people that were on my staff from previous column lives. And Nora was one of them. And I was absolutely happy that I had the privilege to work with such a qualified, dedicated individual. Nora and I are a fantastic team. And we have a fantastic staff here, too. So I don't want to take anything away from any others. But Nora is an example of an absolute professional. She has not only the manufacturing operations, so all areas of the plant report to her. So general assembly, body shop, paint shop. In addition to that, all engineering organizations report to her as well as the maintenance organization. So she has a very large responsibility in this manufacturing facility. And I would say nothing but absolutely the best regarding her ability to get that job done with absolute professionalism. Kai, let's take our final break. And in segment number three, we're going to talk more about the new mid-engine C8 on Corvette today. Vetfinders.com is the internet's original Corvette classified ads website with classified ads starting at just $25. And every ad runs until your Corvette is sold. If you're in the market for a Corvette, Vetfinders.com has over 500 Corvettes for sale from all around the USA and Canada and covering all eight generations. Visit Vetfinders.com finders.com the internet's destination for buying and selling corvettes that's v-e-t-t-e finders.com kc trends motorsports has been the midwest's largest custom wheel superstore for over 25 years they specialize in c8 wheel fitments from the top brands in the industry like hre vossen adv1 avant-garde and more they ship daily from their kansas city location to all upper 48 states with the best pricing and inventory in the country need tires kc trends motorsports has you covered they have tires in stock from michelin and pirelli plus they can help you with a customized wheel and tire combo for your corvette to truly make it one of a kind and if you need wheel ideas no problem simply go online to kctrends.com for their car and wheel visualizer see the wheels on your corvette before you purchase also there's dozens of wheels and tire combo pictures to look through online to spur your imagination and their expert staff is there to help you with wheel and tire sizing and offsets for your c6 c7 and c8 corvette visit them online at kctrends.com see them on facebook and instagram Make any Corvette a -a one-of-a-kind with KC Trends Motorsports. Call them toll-free, 877-962-5200. KC Trends Motorsports. This is the Corvette Today podcast with Steve Garrett. Thanks for listening to Corvette Today, the podcast that talks about everything Corvette. I'm your host, Steve Garrett. With me today, Mr. Kai Spandy, the plant manager at the Bowling Green Assembly Plant in Bowling Green, Kentucky, the home of Corvette. In this third segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about the new mid-engine C8 Corvette. Kai, moving from a front-engine platform to a mid-engine platform takes a lot of doing. Talk about all the months and months of planning and preparation you had to have in order to convert the plan over to the mid-engine platform. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting topic, Steve, that maybe a number of people might not even have any idea about how do you even do that and how we do that, it starts in our plant. I have a rule as it relates to project implementation. There's a couple fundamental rules. There's no inventions on the critical path. There's no rookies that are on the launch team. The list goes on and on. These are the things that I've learned over years and years and years. And the best way that you can describe it is that you have to take the best people in your organization and you have to give them the opportunity to start studying the challenges associated with the task at hand. This is coupled also with many systems and processes that we have within our company. So we have structured processes saying that before start of regular production, 20 weeks before you should be doing this and you should be doing this and you should be doing this. So 
when we couple great talent with the systems and processes that we have in our company based on the experience of launching new cars, we get this result that is very, very powerful. So what are the specific challenges that we have? Ironically, all those things that I just mentioned, the best people, we have them, we put them in the project. And we're not talking two, three, four people. We had a launch team and we still have many of those intact. We have 50, 60, 70 people that are helping make sure that the launch is going the way that we want it. They're dedicated to these operations. That's what we did. However, there's not a real good rule book on creating the world's newest supercar that has an engine behind the driver. So unfortunately, many of the systems and processes that we have, we had to modify because they just maybe didn't apply perfectly to the creation of this new fantastic car. So early and often, we had a tremendous amount of reviews. We had a lot of people up in Michigan looking at the car, understanding how it goes together. And we have fantastic industrial engineers that figure out how to layer all of this work together. You can imagine the hundreds and thousands of pieces of this car that have to go together to just make that happen is mind boggling. And that is the challenge of this launch team, along with our engineering team. How can you build it with quality, with productivity in a safe manner? It has to be a monumentous task, and you guys have done it with flying colors. It's just been absolutely fantastic. Also, Kai, during the pandemic, I know that there's a lot of measures taken just to make sure that all the employees at Bowling Green are safe. Talk about some of those things as you integrate those with transitioning from a front engine platform to a mid-engine platform. This time last year, the world was a different place for sure. I'm very proud to say that our company, General Motors, led many aspects of the industry or really just the business world in developing the countermeasures required to get people back to work safely. Many companies took what we did as a template and copied them. And I'm very happy to say that they have made our employees safe. Over the last months, we have had individuals that have experienced COVID personally. However, their exposure has always been somewhere outside of our factory. So we provide a very safe operation here where we are checking temperatures of everybody coming in. We're providing hand sanitizer. And of course, masks are required in all aspects of our operation. So this has been the key to us maintaining the capacity. If we had a problem, we could lose very key individuals that are helping build this car. So we look at the idea of protecting people's lives also protects their livelihood. And this was really the mantra that we had a long time ago. It was a big challenge. If you remember a year ago, it was a big challenge that the world was going through and we slogged through it. And now while we still faced our own individual challenges, I can say that the health and well-being of our people has been protected. Absolutely. That's great to hear too. Kai, let's talk about some of the work stoppages that you guys have experienced and how that affects the assembly plant. (laughs) I look back and the challenges that we had starting with a strike with the UAW, and then we got this factory off the ground in February 3rd of 2020. We ran for nine weeks, and then we shut the factory down for the same number of weeks. And then we came back to work and we had all of our own struggles. I would tell you that any rule that's out there for what situation is optimal for launching a new car We have broken all of those rules, not by anything that we've done, by the situation that we found ourselves in. So I really, at the risk of diverting the question here, I would like to take the opportunity to make sure everybody recognizes that the people inside this factory are working on a daily basis to do one thing and one thing only, and that's to make these cars in the best quality and productive way that we know how for all of our customers. That's absolutely the case. We come to work, and that's what the result is, these cars moving out the back of the factory to our customers. Well, you've done a fantastic job, Kai. It's kind of like, okay, let's start a revolutionary new car, and let's throw in a strike, (laughs) and then let's throw in a pandemic and see how they deal with it. You know, it's just been absolutely incredible, the story behind the mid-end and Corvette has been really, really amazing. And you throw in the pandemic, you throw in strikes, you throw in part shortages, you throw in chip shortages, and you guys have still made this thing work and work well. Yep. You know what it it means to me is that no matter how you want to measure it, and this is kind of an interesting twist here, whether it's Corvette racing 
whether it's the Corvette assembly plant, whether it's the Corvette engineering team, it doesn't matter what gets put in front of us. We find a way to go out and finish on top. And that's the winning attitude that everybody has coming to this factory up in Michigan with the engineering team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We just are driven. We want to make things happen. And that's what we do. And it shows you make a quality product that is world class. And that's for sure. And that's just my personal opinion. But you know what? My personal opinion is the same. I echo many, many people. So (laughs) Kai, talk about the assembly line when you're talking about coupes versus hardtop convertibles. Right. How does that differ? You know, how does that work when you're building a coupe and building an HTC? Well, this goes back to our manufacturing engineering and our industrial engineering. How do we set up those systems? And our goal for many aspects is to make the ability for us to build a coupe or a convertible seamless in our operations. And even going back into the paint shop where we have to paint these different kind of panels and we have different colors. And at the risk of expanding your question a little bit, some people may, but most don't know that we lock our schedules three to four weeks ahead of production, meaning I could tell you in three weeks the car that would be produced on any given day or at least in sequential order. Wow. And that's something that is very, very different. So when I paint a car or the panel sets for a car, I know that it's a convertible. I know that it's red mist. I'm actually looking outside at my car right now, which happens (laughs) to be red mist, which is a fantastic color, by the way. And then that starts moving through the factory. It goes into the body shop and then the door ring is put on. And then what you were specifically talking about, then what has to happen in the assembly process that's different between coupe and convertible? We have stations in our line that in this case are dedicated to the retractable hardtop. And that retractable hardtop, it all comes pre-assembled. The panels are painted and it's kind of stacked together neatly in a giant bundle. We have some space on the line that's dedicated for the installation of that hardtop convertible. And that's what it's used for. So if a coupe is coming down the line, then that space is not utilized. However, from a productivity standpoint, we can't just have people waiting for a convertible to come down the line. So our challenge is how do we balance all of the work so that the individual that is responsible for or individuals responsible to get that retractable hardtop put on, they also have work when the coupe is coming down the line. And that is the real trick because there isn't a separate conveyor that convertibles go down. All cars go down the exact same line. And not just hardtop, convertible, or coupe, they have to also handle all the other variations, the 104 different seats and all of the different options, which all come to the line in sequential order. Material-wise, it's mind-boggling the amount of combinations that can be built with this car. And it is magic to make sure that we build the cars absolutely correctly every time. That's amazing. Kai. I- Let's get personal here. I know that you drive one every day, but is there a C8 in Kai Spandy's future? And if there is, if you purchase one, what would your spec be? Well, let me tell you a little bit of a story. I was one of the first people that got this red mist. I would have to admit I've got a number of different cars. You know what? I got to go back here. I forgot probably the coolest car that I have, Corvette that I own. I have a 66 427, 425 horse four speed car that actually is sitting over at the museum now on display. Wow. That, that's a fantastic car. But you're talking about what car would I buy? I have to be honest, I probably wouldn't buy a car right now because I have access to drive one from a company standpoint. So maybe the question is, what do I spec out? What would be my preference? Yes. And I have ordered the 2022 model that I will drive for a company standpoint. And that car will be a convertible. It will be a 3LT. It will be red mist with some black accents, dark interior with red stitching, Z51 with an FE4 suspension, that gets a majority of it right there. It's going to be a fantastic car. That sounds good. I know that people can't come into the Bowling Green Assembly Plant for a tour yet. At the birthday bash in April, you had talked about, because the first question always to you is, when is the plant tour going to start? Have you got any updates about that yet? No, we really don't. But I always like to look at the positive side of things. The CDC lifted some of the restrictions on mask usage, et cetera, et cetera. Specifically in Kentucky at this point in time, 43% of all of the population have been vaccinated. 
in my opinion, we are on the top of the curve of conservatism relating to the COVID countermeasures. And I'm really hopeful that we can, as a society and as a company, relax some of those requirements and still maintain safety for people. And that means that then we can get people into our factory. I can't give you a time frame. I guess the counterpoint would be, well, when can we release all of the COVID requirements? Not just with the CDC, OSHA is involved from an industrial safety standpoint. Every state, every community has different laws. And our company has partnered with some of the other automakers to make sure that we maintain some consistency so that we're common across various sites. So my answer would be as soon as we can and keep our people safe and make sure that the people coming into the factory are safe. We do know without a doubt that our employees like visitors. They like to be appreciated for the work that they do. It's absolutely fantastic. I use this term, you know, a symbiotic relationship. Our Corvette customers and our Corvette engineering team and our Corvette manufacturing operations, including the museum, we are all better when we're together and we're sharing in these experiences. And that includes every one of our customers that would like to come through our factory. So it's just a matter of time, Steve. We we just have to be a little bit of patient. That's true. We're hoping that sooner than later as well, Kai. Mm -hmm. Kai, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Corvette today. It's been an honor and a pleasure having you here. Maybe we can do this again really, really soon. Yep. Just let me know, Steve. I love the opportunity. I would take one last little plug here to recognize everybody that's working inside this factory every day, helping to build this fantastic car for all of our customers. We do it for all of those that are out there listening to this, and we do it proudly, and we love it. That's perfect. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for listening to Corvette Today, and thanks to our sponsors, American Hydrocarbon at AmericanHydrocarbon.com and KC Trends Motorsports at KCTrends.com. And don't forget E-Tech Custom Coatings at E-T-E-K Custom Coatings.com or call 913-745-3732. You've been listening to Corvette Today with Steve Garrett. If you'd like to contact Steve with any thoughts on the podcast or ideas for guests on Corvette Today, you can email him at stevegarrettdj at gmail.com. That's stevegarrettdj at gmail.com. Garrett has two R's and two T's. Or connect with Steve on social media on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram using at stevegarrettdj. Thanks again for listening to Corvette Today.